Well, this morning we're going to take a, a little break, a little hiatus from our studies on the parables. I want to go to a, a passage that, uh, that I have preached on once before here, I will admit, and that I'd like to talk to you about today as well. And I've titled today's message, Beyond a Doubt, and in your bulletin there are, uh, there's an outline to follow along. Again, it's a two-sided outline, so don't let that confuse you at all um, as you look to perhaps write some things down this morning. So, I'm going to ask you, if you will, take your Bibles, turn to the book of John, and we are going to be in John chapter 20 this morning, and uh, I want to give you a little background of where we are in John as to you know, what, is, what is happening grabbing the context of what's going on. Uh, if we come into the story in the book of John, we are past, uh, Jesus has been crucified. Jesus has rose from the dead, although, however, that's not very common knowledge yet. The woman came to the tomb to bring fresh linens for the body of Jesus. They found out that he wasn't there. They reported to the disciples and Peter and John, as John reports, that he and Peter uh, ran to the tomb Although John was a better athlete, so John got there first. He doesn't say he was a better athlete, but does John does take a moment to say that he beat Peter to the tomb. <laughs> <laughs> it's a true statement, you know. It's one of those fun little things you find in Scripture. And they saw that Jesus was not there. and Jesus has uh, um, appeared to the other disciples in the upper room after John and uh, Peter had returned. But there was a disciple missing. His name was Thomas. When we think of Thomas, we, 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 there's a wonderful phrase that comes along with him. He's referred to as a doubting Thomas. Sometimes we refer to other people as a doubting Thomas. And that's kind of an unfortunate uh, label that Thomas gets. There are a few unfortunate uh, labels in, in the Bible. Doubting Thomas is pretty bad. I think the, pretty, the worst one is Rahab the prostitute. I'm pretty sure that's the, the roughest label that somebody in, in the Bible has to deal with. But... Thomas is known for his doubting, but today, as I share this with you, I think maybe you might look at Thomas in a little different light and be able to appreciate Thomas a little more. But as I said, Thomas wasn't there when Jesus had appeared to the disciples. So we're going to start in verse 24, and we're going to kind of read this passage as, as we go along this morning. And the first idea is this, is the issue of unbelief. Look with me at verses 24 and 25. In chapter 20, and look at what it says here. It says, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not Believe. Wow. You see, unbelief was a major issue in Jesus' day. The Jews crucified Jesus. Why? Because they didn't believe he was who he said he was. Had they believed Jesus and believed that he was the Messiah, they would have never crucified him. The Messiah that they had been waiting for for generations. Had they truly believed that that's who Jesus was, they wouldn't have crucified him. But they didn't believe. And Jesus was put to death. You see, the disciples themselves had to develop in their belief of Jesus as well. And we see the disciples going on this journey of belief as they spend time with Jesus and as they grow in their understanding of who Christ is. Even at the Last Supper when Jesus was explaining to his disciples what was going to happen, a lot of his disciples were very confused. You know, when Jesus told his disciples, um, you know, when we get to Jerusalem, all this bad stuff's going to happen to me. And not really grasping the bigger picture, Peter says the obvious thing. Well, then let's not go to Jerusalem, which would have been my response, right? You know, if I go up to the cities today, I'm going to get mugged. Well, then let's not go to the cities. Okay? Right. It makes complete sense. But in their disciples growing in their understanding of Jesus, we see a growth in their belief. Thomas is evidence of that development of belief. 
You see, even though the other disciples had seen Jesus and were trying to convince Thomas that Jesus had rose from the grave, their testimony wasn't enough for him. No, Thomas, really, he was here. We saw him, we was here. You know what? I don't believe it. He remained unconvinced. You see, Thomas' own experience was that he saw Jesus die. He saw Jesus hang on the cross. He saw them nail his hands to the cross. He saw them stick a spear in his side. He saw Jesus die, and now they're telling him that he's alive? Thomas doesn't believe it. He wanted physical proof that Jesus had rose from the grave. Now, I'm going to cut Thomas a little slack here. This was pretty unbelievable news, was it not? He saw him die. It was unbelievable news. What do you mean he's alive again? Come on, that just doesn't happen. Except for Lazarus, but that was a totally different thing. So I do cut Thomas a little slack here, and I, I can understand his unbelief because of what he has experienced, because of what Thomas witnessed, because of what Thomas knew or thought he knew, and what Thomas saw. So it comes to the second idea of proof positive. Look at verses 26 and 27 with me, please. And it says this, After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. And when he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands, and reach here your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. So it's kind of interesting that Jesus goes right to Thomas. He comes in, pronounces a blessing. Um, I'm sorry, I got, I got ahead of myself here. He comes in and says, peace to all of you, and goes right to Thomas and presents Thomas with the proof that he needs. Here you go, Thomas. What would you say you wanted to do? Go ahead, put your fingers in there. Go ahead. Put your hand in my side. Go ahead. I'm pretty sure Thomas's reaction was, it's okay. I don't think I need to do that. You know, was Thomas being a little dramatic in his unbelief? Maybe. Jesus presented Thomas with the proof he needed, and he told Thomas to, to, to stop doubting and believe. He challenges Thomas to believe and to commit after being shown the truth. You know, he doesn't chastise him. He doesn't ridicule him. He doesn't come in and say, Thomas, what's the matter with you? How come you wouldn't believe your brother's here? He simply comes in and says, peace be with you all. Hey, Thomas, come here. Look. It's really me. It's really, really me. I think it's awesome there's no reprimand from Jesus whatsoever. Jesus simply provides Thomas with what he needs to believe. He provides him with what he needs to believe. Remember I said that. Look at Thomas' response in verse 28. What Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. This is an amazing statement for Thomas to make. He says, my Lord and my God. And we go, well, okay. That's kind of a cool statement. But you have to understand this. Is in, in the Jewish culture and in the Jewish faith, no man would ever say to another man, my Lord and my God. If he were to say that, he would be accused of blasphemy. For Thomas to say this is amazing to recognize Jesus for who he truly is. But you have to look at the transformation that has taken place here in Thomas. Look what happened here. A skeptic who doubted. He was presented with the truth. And his response is one of humility and worship. He says, my Lord, in other words, you are the boss. You are the Lord. You are Lord over me. That is humility. And then he says, my God, a recognition of who he is and an attitude of worship. His response is one of humility 
and worship. And I think so often we talk about Thomas as doubting Thomas. But I think that when we do that, we forget one of the most awesome moments in all of Scripture. All the truths that have been communicated to Thomas over the last three years as he walked with Jesus, as he lived with Jesus, as he talked with Jesus, as he heard Jesus teach and preach and share things about the kingdom of heaven, all those things were finally realized for Thomas. Suddenly, the lights had come on for him. What an amazing moment for Thomas. This is an amazing moment moment in scripture we see an incredibly dynamic change in thomas who eight days earlier was saying you know what almost a little sarcastic unless i put my fingers in those holes unless i get to put my hand in his side i don't believe you guys to eight days later proclaiming to jesus you are my lord and you are my god it's an amazing moment when an individual comes to a saving understanding of Jesus Christ, isn't it? I don't know if you've ever had that privilege. I pray that you have. And if you haven't, I pray that you will. But I've had the privilege of sitting with individuals and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ and seeing the lights come on. And you go, wow, God just did it, didn't he? God just stepped in and opened your eyes and opened your heart when the scales are lifted from their eyes, and they've been totally transformed. One of my favorite Christian songs was written, and I'm showing my age now, 40, gosh, 40 years ago, or a little more, by two awesome early Christian artists by the name of, of uh, Keith Green and Randy Stonehill. And those of you who are older like me, you guys know who these two individuals are. They wrote a wonderful song, and the name of the song was called Your Love Broke Through. And in this song, they express that moment in their own lives where their eyes and their hearts were open to the truth of Jesus Christ. I want to read the lyrics to the song for you, uh, lyrics of the song for you. And this is what it says. Like a foolish dreamer trying to build a highway to the sky, all my hopes would come tumbling down, and I never knew just why. Until today, when you pulled away the clouds that hung like curtains on my eyes, and well, I've been blind in all these wasted years, and I thought I was so wise, but you took me by surprise. All my life, I've been searching. Excuse me, I've had a rough week, so if I get a little emotional, I apologize. All my life, I've been searching for that crazy missing part. And with one touch, you rolled away the stone that held my heart. And now I see that the answer was as easy as just asking you in. And I'm so sure I could never doubt your gentle touch again. It's like the power of the wind. Like waking up from the longest dream. How real it seemed until your love broke through. I've been lost in a fantasy that, that blinded me until your love broke through. What an awesome expression of the heart of an individual or individuals who are recalling that moment when God opened their eyes to his truth, just as Thomas had experienced here. Years ago, I met a man by the name of Paul. Uh, I was at a men's retreat, and I met Paul. He was one of the most amazing people I ever met in my life. Paul was 74 years old, and he had come to this men's retreat, and we had a moment where we broke up in pairs and prayed for one another. And I got paired up with Paul. Now here I was, a young 20-something guy. Beth Ann and I had been married, I think, less than a year. It was my first men's retreat. Pretty young Christian at the time, too. And I'm sitting with this guy who, in my mind, oh gosh, this is a guy, 74 years old. 
stoic believer, I'm going to be able to glean so much from him. And as I sit and I listen to Paul talk and share his testimony, Paul had only been saved for a couple of years. Paul got saved at age 71. And he shared with me the regret of his life of spending all those years living without the truth of Jesus Christ. But then he smiled and sat and proclaimed with me the grace of God that allowed him to have his eyes open, even as a 71-year-old, stubborn old man whose eyes and heart were open to the truth of Jesus. He is possibly the most humble man I've ever met in my life pretty confident he's home with the Lord now. I praise God for that because if he was still here, he would be oh, in his mid to upper 90s by now, but still. What an awesome glimpse of me to see a man who still was as fresh in his heart the truth that God had shown him to. Now we get to even some better stuff, and I want to talk about being especially blessed especially blessed. Look at verse 29. And this is, this is really cool. This is the part where I walk away feeling really good. And this is what it says. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? In other words, rhetorically, of course you've believed. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. So he says, he's saying to uh, Thomas, wow, you saw and you believed. That's Awesome. But let me tell you something. Blessed are those who do not see, yet believe. He pronounces a blessing on, those, on all those who come to faith without actually seeing the physical evidence of a resurrected Jesus Christ. Do you know what's really cool about that statement? That's us. That's us who've come to know Jesus without seeing him resurrected. We've simply read about it. We've simply heard about it. And we are blessed because of it. You see, our belief is based on the proclamation of the gospel and the evidences for its validity. You see, friends, we're not deprived because we weren't there like the disciples were. On the contrary, we are especially blessed. Our faith is based not on what we have seen, but what God has impressed upon our hearts. To me, yeah, we're especially blessed because I firmly believe that gives our faith a greater foundation as believers. That gives our faith a greater foundation because we haven't had the physical evidence set before us like Thomas had with Jesus Christ. But knowing the truth of Jesus' resurrection is huge. It helps us believe. It helps our faith and our belief. <coughs> Excuse me. In Jesus Christ. Because Jesus' resurrection does five things to help us with our belief. And this is on the second page of your outline if you want to write these ideas down. And I don't know if you've ever really thought this through. But Jesus' resurrection does five things to help us with our belief. And the first thing is this. It demonstrates that his predictions about being raised from the dead were true. All the things that Jesus said were going to happen about him happened they were true, showing who he is. His predictions were true, giving validity to the resurrection. The second thing that his resurrection does is that it proves that he is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. He rose from the dead. You know, that's the linchpin, friends. That's the linchpin. And it was for Thomas, was it not? Thomas had a hard time believing Jesus was raised from the dead. But once he saw that he was, Thomas's eyes and his heart were open to all that Jesus had taught and all that Jesus had said to him. The third thing is this. It testifies to the success of his mission of salvation. It means that Jesus' sacrifice was sufficient. It means that Jesus' mission to come to this earth, to die for our sins, was successful. Jesus carried our sins to the cross, died, and was buried. He was raised by the Father to show the Father's acceptance, approval, and approval, and the validity of Jesus' sacrifice. 
I don't know if you've ever thought about that. Jesus rose from the dead because the Father approved of the sacrifice. It gives validity to Jesus' mission of salvation. The fourth, or, or where am I, four? Yeah. The fourth thing is it entitles Jesus to a position of glory. That's why we call Jesus Lord, because of what he has done for us. He has that position of glory, and that's what number five is. It proclaims that Jesus is Lord, and he is Lord of our lives. He has shown authority over sin and authority over death. Therefore, I think there's no one else that I'd rather have as Lord over my life. Five simple things that happen that the resurrection does for us. Now, we could probably do 20 more, but we'll stop at five because I'll give you five to chew on this week. I want you to look at verses 30 and 31 of what John says here. He says, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John says, I wrote this gospel so that you would read this and put your faith in Jesus Christ. Read this and believe and have life through Jesus Christ. John knew that it was important to write his gospel. Of course, God and the Holy Spirit guided and directed him. But the importance of it was so that others would read and come to faith in Jesus Christ. Because unbelief was a major issue. And friends, unbelief is a major issue today, is it not? Many people today ignore, deny, or rationalize Jesus' miracles. How many times have you watched on National Geographic or the History Channel, and they're going to tell you how naturally the, the Red Sea would have been parted? Well, it really wasn't the Red Sea. It was the Reed Sea, and it was only six inches deep. And if a strong enough wind blows this way, it's separated so they could walk across. Well, that's great, but then how did Pharaoh and his troops all drown in six inches of water? That doesn't really work, does it, friends? People ignore the truth of Jesus Christ. They ignore the truth of his miracles. They want to rationalize everything. Can Jesus do what he does through the laws of nature? Sure he could. Does he have to? No, he doesn't. I'm pretty sure the resurrection wasn't within the laws of nature. There are 35 miracles of Jesus recorded in the four Gospels. People today doubt because they have not seen, just like Thomas. They have not seen. But just like Thomas, Jesus presents the truth that is needed to be presented for us to come to faith in Jesus Christ, just like he did for Thomas. He does for mankind through his word. And this is tough, friends, because there's always going to be people who don't believe. Some who will be, never be convinced, no matter what truth is laid before them, no matter how much is laid before them as truth, they're still going to try to rationalize it away. Do you know that in studying human DNA, and they've, they've studied so much about human DNA now, and they've, they've studied all the different strands and everything, that scientists have come to the conclusion that every man on this earth, because of the DNA strands and some specific markers, can all be traced back to one woman. Well, we hear that and we go, well, duh. Ever heard of Adam and Eve? So would science conclude, wow, the story of Adam and Eve must be true. No, science's conclusion is, well, why did the descendants of all the other women die off so quickly? Even when the truth is presented and the truth lines up with the message of the gospel and what God's word says, people are still not going to believe. But friends, I want to tell you this. Do not be discouraged. Do not be discouraged. Because for all the ones who will never believe and never humble themselves and never open their hearts to the truth of the gospel message, there are others who will. 
We are all a living testimony of that. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are a living testimony to the truth that people will open their hearts to the truth of the message of the gospel, period. I tell you not to be discouraged because we need to continue to put the word out. John says all this stuff has been written down so you can read it and you can believe. However, people need, need to be directed to the truth of God's word. People need to be directed to the truth of Jesus Christ, the truth of the message of the gospel. And friends, that's our job. It's really, really cool because God desires to use us to play a part in sharing the good news of the gospel with others. We are called to share that truth with others. So never be discouraged by those who doubt. Never be discouraged by those who who frustrate the snot out of you when you, the evidence is right before their eyes because there's others whose eyes and hearts will be open. Keep sharing. Never give up. Keep communicating the truth of Jesus Christ because that's what we are called to do. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the example of Thomas and the reminder of those whose eyes and hearts have been opened up to your truth, just like it was for us. I pray, Lord, that uh, you would continue to inspire and encourage us to share your truth with others as we um, live this life, as we are your ambassadors, and as we carry the message of the gospel.